Very pleased to see everybody. Enjoy your run in the torrential rain to get here. I'm impressed, young man, I'm impressed. I was given three instructions before I came here tonight. Number one is don't waffle. I'll try not to do that. Uh, don't read too much. I'll try not to do that. And read properly and we'll endeavour to do that. So that's where we are at the minute. Turn to Acts chapter 4, please. I'm going to give an, an apology as well. Because uh, in April, Stu uh, Stuart said to me, you're up for a minister meeting. I said, no, I'm not. And it was my diary keeping is not the best either. Uh, so we're going to break in at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We could probably read the whole thing, but bear in mind my instructions. Uh, we're going to start at verse 12. Uh, well, verse 11. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Go down to verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people for all glorified God for what was done. Uh, and we'll go into uh, uh, verse 24. This is a prayer meeting. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou hast appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said they anything that ought, let me re try that again. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man accord, according as he had need. And Joseph, whom the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, uh, which be, is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira's wife, sold the possession and kept back of the part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back of part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, 
but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was the space of but three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Then Peter answered her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among all the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest uh, durst or dared no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both men and women. And we look to God to bless the reading of his word uh, this, this evening. We'll just pray, Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the reading. Of thy word, the thoughts that thou hast laid on our heart, we pray for help to deliver them. We pray for help to understand them and grow thereby. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I've been working through Acts. I'm not going to ask you what I spoke on the last time. I might uh, recap some of it in the midst of this here. But we're in uh, Acts, primarily Acts 5. And this is a very difficult passage. Uh, I don't pretend to understand it all, but it's where I'm reading, uh, it's where I am, it's where you are tonight, so we're going to see if we can learn some things from this story. It's not actually a story, it's an event, it's a very sad event uh, in the beginning of the church, and a warning to us all that little things can cause great results. So what we want to do is, for simplicity, I like we sort of headlines or alliteration, so I want to think, uh, first of all, of the fearlessness of the church. I want to think of the fellowship of the church. I want to think of the filling of the church. I want to think of the foolishness in the church. And I want primarily to think of the fear in the church. Fearlessness, fellowship, filled, foolishness and fear. Is fear a bad thing? Is fear a bad thing? Is it good to be afraid? And we'll look at that uh, shortly. So I just want to just continue on where we were. Uh, Peter and John uh, went, went to the temple, as we know. This man who, uh, who was basically carried there and sat there for a number of years, 40 years old, the man was. He could do nothing to save himself. And in the name of Jesus, he was made completely whole. Dr. Peter's diagnosis and chapter 3 says, this man before you is completely whole. The power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, great things can be done. And of course, when Jesus' name is proclaimed, eh, people don't like it. When, people, when Jesus' name is proclaimed as the only way of salvation, people hate it. And of course, the, the apostles are being persecuted. And they come, and, they, and basically where we are here, they come in chapter 4. And at the start of chapter 4, they say, by what, in verse 7, by the, they stood Peter and John in the midst and they said, by what power or by what name have you done this thing? It, rem it reminds me so much of when the Lord Jesus was here and they said, by whose authority do you do these things and who gave thee this authority? And then Jesus went on to answer them. And they asked him no more questions after that. So Peter, in verse 8, it says, He was filled with the Holy Ghost and said unto, the, unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we be this day examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he's made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, 
Even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The fearlessness of the early church. They were not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not ashamed to proclaim that they, the religion that they'd been brought up in was dead. It was derelict now. No more sacrifice for sin. Christ has died. Christ was buried. Christ is risen again from the dead. No more sacrifice for sin. One sacrifice, Hebrew says, for sins forever and Jesus has sat down. No more sacrifice. That system is dead. That system is derelict. God instituted it in order that he could bring Christ in. The Old Testament is now done. The New Testament is here and we're preaching life. We're preaching a life through Jesus Christ, through his death and through his rising again. And Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Peter was not ashamed. But do you remember that Peter had been ashamed? Remember, Peter had denied the Lord Jesus. Remember, Peter went away and wept bitterly with tears. And the Lord Jesus met him on resurrection ground. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And Peter had a burden to preach the gospel. He was not ashamed anymore. Oh, Peter, you denied. He's not denying now. Peter is emboldened. He's filled with the Spirit of God. And he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed of Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed to preach the message of repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just wonder, brothers and sisters, where we are. Are we ashamed to mention the name of Jesus? Are we ashamed to mention the name of Jesus? Are we ashamed to mention the cross of Christ? Are we ashamed to tell men and women that they need to be saved? There is a salvation for sinners. There is a salvation for all. And it's only through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we ashamed? Am I ashamed? Are you ashamed to mention the name of Jesus? To proclaim the only one way of salvation. To proclaim salvation and none other. These people were fearless. These people were fearless. Just imagine, these are the chief priests. These are the scribes. These are the elders that crucified Christ. These are the ones that spat in the face of Jesus Christ. These are the ones that looked and probably laughed when Pilate took the scourge and beat the back of Jesus like a ploughed field. These were the ones that looked at Jesus on the cross and said, Oh, if you're really the Christ, you come down and save yourself. These were the people that Peter's speaking to. And he was not afraid. He was fearless. He was fearless because he, he had a desire to tell the children of Israel of the new and living way through our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only was he fearless in preaching the gospel, he wasn't afraid to tap into what they had done. Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, He was not ashamed to bring the the challenge of sin into their lives. You have sinned. Here was Messiah. Here was the anointed one. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had come and you rejected him. You rejected him. There was a time Peter would have been scared to say that. He was scared in the garden. He was scared round the fire, but he wasn't scared. Now he'd been empowered by the Spirit of God. Oh, to get the fearlessness. Oh, that we would be fearless. To present the gospel. You know there's some people. Uh, are fearless. But you know there's some people. You know uh, if you said right. Come come with us and we'll, we'll speak in the open air. Oh, I don't know about that. You know it, it's okay in church. It's okay in a building. But you know people might laugh at me. And all the rest of it. I'll tell you a wee story. Uh, when we were in the church down in Kirkconnell. We were down in Sanker. Uh, one time. And uh, one of, uh, some of Peter's pals went by. And we were standing open there, and Peter was probably about 14 or 15 years old. And I don't know whether it was me or who else was speaking, but, but they went by. Uh, and uh, I, I could see Peter getting a wee bit red, because he knew he was going to get in for it on Monday morning. 
Uh, so Monday came. Monday came. And one of the girls says, Oh, Peter, I saw you was out in your open air church yesterday. Oh, uh, and this, that, and all. I don't remember what the whole story was. And that's hard for a young person. That's hard for a young person not to be afraid. Not to be afraid of your uh, friends. Not to be afraid of your school chums. Not to be afraid of your tutors and all the rest of it. It's a hard thing to do that. It's maybe easier for old fogies like me now. But I was scared one time too. And so was Stuart. But these people are fearless. And then the next Sunday, Peter had some illness. I don't know what it was, but he wasn't, he wasn't out in open air. You know, you know this? He actually got more stick for no being there than actually being there. Where were you, lad? Where were you yesterday? I saw your dad and the rest of the church round. And where were you? And he actually was, he, he was actually put to shame for not actually being there, although he was genuinely ill. Oh, to be fearless. Oh, to be fearless. But not only were they fearless in their preaching, they were fearless in their prayers. And if you want, sometimes we look, a uh, Lord teach us to pray, the disciples said, and we look at the Lord's prayer. But here's a great prayer here. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole because it wasn't meant I wasn't going to be speaking on this. But it says here the, the, after they were threatened, uh, and Peter said uh, in their fearlessness, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. These men were fearless. What did they do? They didn't say, oh, I sorted them out. I sorted them boys out. I just told them this, that, and other. No, they didn't. They went to the prayer meeting. They went to the prayer meeting and all the church was there. And they lifted up their voice with one accord to God and said, Lord, thou art God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. Who by And here's something for you if you're worried about praying. How do we pray? What do we say? Well, you just exalt the name of God. And then what did they do? They quoted the Bible. You can quote nothing better. Not your thoughts, God's thoughts. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? Verse 26. The kings of the air stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They're quoting the Bible in their prayer. For of a truth against thy holy servant, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Get this, verse 28. This is your plan, God. We're doing your will. We're preaching the gospel. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined afford determined before to be done and now lord behold their threatenings and what was their prayer what was their prayer oh yep let let's give it to the scribes and the pharisees again no it wasn't <coughs> let's do this that and all or no it wasn't verse 29 and now lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy servant Jesus. What a prayer that was. Acknowledging the greatness of God. Acknowledging the Lord Jesus Christ. Quoting Bible verses from the Old Testament. And asking for boldness. Asking to be fearless in the presentation of the gospel. Does God answer prayers like that? What's it say? <coughs> Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And here's the answered prayer. They speak the word of God with boldness. What am I going to tell my friends tomorrow about the gospel? We're going to say the word of God. We're going to preach the word of God. Not our thoughts. Not a evolution or against evolution. We're going to quote the word of God. We're going to preach from the word of God. And that's what's normally preached here every Sunday, Albanwell. We preach the word of God. Not our thoughts, not our additions to it. The living word of God. And God answered that prayer. And the place was shaken. Oh, to be in a prayer meeting. Oh, to be in a prayer meeting that God speaks and God shakes. That's the fearlessness of the people. Briefly, the fellowship. And this is a common theme. I've mentioned this before. And I'm not going to apologize for repetition because 
the Spirit of God has told us again. And verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and of one soul. They could not be any closer. These people, God is moving in the midst. God is speaking in the midst. God is shaking in the midst. And these people are of one soul. Anything they had, they brought, laid it at the apostles' feet. And the apostle gave to him, her, them that it need. Because what happened was, when you left the old Jewish religion, when you left that, there's a fair chance when you went home, you didn't have a home to go to. There's a fair chance, I don't know this, but there's a fair chance if you went to your employer and said, well, I'm very sorry, boss, but I was in Jerusalem uh, and I'm now a believer in Jesus Christ, there's a fair chance you might not have had a job to go to. Uh, you might have been kicked out and these people have nothing. But these people had everything. And these people had everything in common. And God was moving. And God was blessing. It says, they lifted up their voice. In verse 24, they lifted up their voice. And I think that's very important in today's churches. Because we hear these places that uh, God's moving and this, that and other. And they lifted up their voices and this chaos and mayhem. But it says here in verse 24, they lifted up their voice singular. They spoke as one for the glory and the exaltation of our Lord Jesus. They lifted up their voice singular to God with one accord. Verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They spake the word with boldness. Verse 32, one heart, one soul, all things common. Verse 33, and great grace was upon them all. And verse 34, none lacked. What a church that would have been part of. How exciting it would have been to have been a member of the church when dozens, thousands were coming into the kingdom of God. And all these people were coming, praising God with one accord. And God's moving. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong in a church of hundreds and thousands? What could possibly go wrong? Here's these people and they've got all things common. They're fearless for the gospel. And here we've got a bit of foolishness. Foolishness. I couldn't think of another word for it. Ananias and Sapphira. Here they are. And I, I listened to a couple of sermons. And I thought, mm, there's an awful lot of speculation. That's about Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, they did this because of that. They, they, they did this because, well, uh, if you look in the end of chapter 4, it says that Joseph's surname Barnabas brought a, a, all this money and laid it at the apostle's feet. Well, well done, Joseph's good man. And uh, this, that, and all, and plaudits were given to him. Maybe they wanted that. We don't know. But the key thing is, the key thing is, they were stopping the work of God. You might say, Oh, it's only a wee lie. You might say, because that's what Peter says is a lie. You might say it was only a wee white lie because they were giving money to the Lord's work, you know, and they were getting hailed for it and all the rest of it. But it was a lie. And a lie is sin. So God is moving. God is shaking. And God is bringing these thousands together as one. And the whole church comes to a stop. It reminds me of the sin of Achan. Don't touch anything of the Babylonians. Touch nothing. It's polluted. And any treasure is to be for God. And Achan stole. And Achan hid. You can read the story yourself. Google it if you want. And the whole children of Israel stopped. Because of one man's sin. And as I look into my heart. And as I look into you, your heart, you know whether you're living right before God. You know whether your motives are right before God. You know whether you are lying to God. Because we all can put on a front. We all can put on an act. But God is a judge. Ananias, Ananias, ironically, his name is who the Lord has graciously given. Ananias, his sin was stopping the work of God. Peter says in verse 3 in chapter 5, you have lied to the Holy Ghost. You have lied to the Holy Ghost. And that word is you have deceived with a lie. 
you have tried to deceive God with a lie. Think of the prayer. Think of the prayer in chapter 4. Think of that prayer that God knows everything. God made everything and God has programmed everything. And were Ananias and Sapphira there? I don't know that, but maybe you know that. But if they were there, they would have heard that prayer. They would have been filled with the Spirit of God. And here they are, a little sin. A wee bit of deceit. And you would have seen, there's Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, they've sold that farm down the road for a half a million quid. And they've given this big sack of money. You're not going to count it. But they've given it to the Lord. And they're applauded for it. Applauded for it. But they had lied to the Holy Ghost. Not only did they lie to the Holy Ghost, they had lied to God. Now, yes, the Holy Ghost is part of the triune God. And we'll maybe need to do a talk on the Holy Ghost because the Acts is the Acts of the Holy Ghost, as far as I'm aware, in the start of the church here. So we'll maybe do that for another time. But they had lied to the Holy Ghost. They had lied to God. And a sapphire was told they had tempted God. They had tempted God. And what that word tempt means is they were trying to see if they could get away with it. Not only were they lying but they were devious with it as well. Lied to God. I'm going through the teens at the minute. Matthew 16. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And here we are. The church is growing. The church is multiplying. The church has been blessed. We've got fearless preaching. We've got signs and wonders. And God is moving. The, 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 the bride of the Lamb is being created. And we've got sin. Sin that stops. Sin that separates. Sin that corrodes. Is God going to overlook this? Is God going to overlook this? And the answer is no. And God will judge sin. Sooner or later God will judge sin. And in this instant, brothers and sisters, it was immediate. It was basically as soon as Peter said, he fell down dead. Fell down dead. A lie. A lie. The foolishness of it. I don't know where we are for time here. Right? So, I want to look at two more wee things in relation to this event. And I want to look at being filled. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but there's two fillings here. This is not a sandwich bar. But there's two fillings here, right? There's the filling in the church and the, where are we at here? Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word with boldness. Now, as I say, I do no idea whether Ananias and Sapphira were at that prayer meeting. I have no idea. But it says that everyone there was filled with with the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It means they were filled full. There was no room for anything else. There was no room for anyone else. They were filled. They were filled. But we get to chapter 5 and verse 3. What's that? About six verses later. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost. And as I thought of that. I was wondering what my heart's filled with. I was wondering what my mind is filled with. I remember that the Lord Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. He said blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they will be filled. Are you hungry for the word of God? Are you hungry for more of God? Are you hungry for more of the Spirit of God? Are you hungry to live right? Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Or are you like Ananias and Sapphira? Proverbs 14 and 14 says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. What are we filled with? Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? A filling. Maybe we are scared to be filled with the Spirit of God. 
Maybe we are scared to let God take control of our lives. You know, in Acts 13, 52, it says the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. So this infilling of the Holy Ghost is, brings with joy with it. Have you got joy in your life? I looked at the comparison in Romans Romans 1. The, the sinner, uh, you can read the story if you want in Romans chapter 1. It's a horrible a description of sin and all the rest. And it says that the people had turned away from God. God had given them over to their own sins. And they were filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, full of murder, debate, deceit, malignity and whispers. That was the description in Romans 1 of the sinful man. But when Paul writes to the Romans and Chapter 15, he says, I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. What a difference. Ephesians 3 and 9 says, And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 5, 18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is access but be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 1 and 9, that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all understanding. Philippines, I think in May when I was looking at the fruits of righteousness here and all the rest of it, but Philippines 1 and 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. There is a filling that needs to be in our lives. We're going to be filled with the Spirit of God. We're going to be filled with the joy of the Lord. We're going to be filled with the righteousness of God and the fruits of the Spirit. Or we're going to be filled with ourselves, our lusts, our desires. And it's going to stop the gospel and you come like if we're going to be like that. Let's pray. Finally, I'm glad that here, the fear, fear came upon all that heard these things. This is not just scared, this is a terror. They were terrified of God moving in their midst. But Job wrote a long, long time before this, And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, this is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The psalmist wrote in 111 and verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's just the beginning. There's more to it. Proverbs 1 and 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But Acts, Acts has got five fears. And with this, I'm just going to read them out to you and leave it. Acts 2 and 43. Acts 2 and 43, and this is a church that's united. This is a church with one aim, for the glory and the, the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And what was the result of that? And fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. The fear of the Lord is in here. Uh, twice in this story of Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 5. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all those that heard these things. They were terrified. They were terrified at the judgment of God. They were terrified at the justice of God. Here was maybe two upright, seemingly upright folk. And they're dead. And what's the job of the young men? To take these folk out and to bury them. Great fear came upon all those things. On all those who heard them. The other ones are when Paul got saved. When Paul became a Christian. And he had he'd been wreaking havoc around all the churches in uh, Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Paul met the Saviour face to face. An apostle is one born out of due time. 
and his life was changed. And, w- and what was the result of that? Acts 9 and 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. What does the fear of the Lord do? It brings reverence. It brings my thoughts into God's thoughts. It brings your thoughts into God's thoughts. It unites us for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It unites us and God moves through us. Acts 9, 31. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and they were multiplied. They were multiplied. What does Acts 19 tell us? And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. His name was magnified. None other name. And in Acts 19, the fear of the Lord brings the Lord Jesus to be magnified. What is the result of the judgment of Ananias and Sapphira? The people in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 12, the people were back again with one accord. God had moved. God had stamped that sin out. God had removed The silt that was blocking the blessing of the gospel. And the church was united with one accord. Verse 14. What is the result of God's moving in justice against Ananias and Sapphira? Multitudes saved. Multitudes saved. A little sin. That little sin seemingly could have destroyed the whole church. But Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. The fear of the Lord. What do we know about that? So thanks very much for listening. We'll just commend ourselves to God. Our Father in heaven. I think of Ananias and Sapphira. And how easy it is. Not to be true. How easy it is to be fake. How easy it is to pretend. Father examine our hearts. Let our motives be pure. And let our heart be clear. And Father, help us to unite for the glory of our Lord Jesus, that his name will be magnified, that the church will have rest and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And we pray for salvation and new coming this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Give him thanks.